thank you for joining. And um, fresh from the farm, How fun job. The audio. The audio works pretty good. Okay, great. So I'll let you yeah, guys so, get started. Yeah, I am Zach. I'm with um, mushroomcult.net, and I offer mushroom cultivation training. I'm Gary with Fresh from the Farm Fungi. I have a um, commercial mushroom farm in Denver, Colorado, and we are at Lion's Mane Mycology Shop in Denver. Um, yeah, so they offer supplies, materials, um, tools, and literature. We have Vera's book here. Um, they have substrates, sterilizers, and all kinds of mushroom cultivation related things that you might need. Um, if you need something special, they can do a special order. Um, one really interesting product that they have a patent pending on is this liquid media extractor so that you can produce a liquid media and then extract it in a sterile fashion. You can find this on their website at lionsmaindenver.com. And last, there's a community board just around the corner over here that you're encouraged to post your mycological related events or um, products on their board over here. So come by and check and see if there's anything that you uh, have to offer or want to find other people offering. So cool. I just want to add a note that I have a video on how to use this media extractor on our YouTube channel. Um, so check that out. It's a fresh from the farm fungi on YouTube and um, I'll start off just by saying thank you to CMS and Lion's Mane for letting us host or host in this event. And I'm going to be going through some um, cultivation techniques. So I prefer to use, you know, a very lab based um, standard technique and I'll run through that whole process and then hand it off to Zach, who's going to show his alternative. So there's a few main tools in mushroom cultivation that every single you know process requires and one of them is going to be a, um, or a, a blade and a sterile blade handle so I like to use these um, autoclavable pouches and they have a indicator that allows you to know when it's sterile so the first step in mushroom cultivation is to get your culture. So I have a blue oyster culture that I'm working with in my commercial farm here. And the first thing that you want to do um, in production is to replicate the mycelium, which is the roots of the mushroom. So in order to do that, you have to take a piece of this auger and transfer it onto a clean auger plate. And that's called an auger to auger transfer. So I'll demonstrate that real quickly. And the purpose of that is so that you can keep a stock culture in order to continue your production. So normally I would be performing these operations under a laminar flow, which is a sterile condition. Um, there's a lot of videos online on that and you can see my whole lab on our YouTube channel but I'm just gonna demonstrate a simple auger to auger transfer. So on this plate, you can see the start of the mycelium is at the center and it will kind of grow out towards the edge. So I'm gonna wanna take my piece of the mycelium from the outer edge because that's gonna be um, where it's growing and the most sterile part of the auger. Um, so you can see here, I'm just going to cut a small wedge and place it onto a new auger petri dish. And then this will grow out in a couple weeks. So I'll have a copy as a backup for my original culture. So I'll do another one of those copies. Um, ideally, you want to do enough that you'll still maintain a sterile culture. So I have my two copies and then these will go into the incubator. So the next part of um, production is going to be an auger to grain transfer. So mycelium will consume this grain and it's a really dense source of nutrients. So I like to use oats, but you can use various sorts of grain. Um, they have a lot of selection of uh, 
rye berries here at Lion's Mane, and that works just as well. So I'll just take a piece of the mycelium, which is the roots of the mushroom, and transfer it into a grain jar. And this grain jar has been sterilized and cooled to room temperature. So it doesn't require a lot, but you can see the mycelium will start colonizing this jar. And after about two weeks, you'll have a fully colonized grain jar. So this is the mycelium that is fully grown out onto the grain. So this is gonna be the next part of the process. And if you have any contamination, it will start to reveal itself as, you know, different color spots, like um, trichoderma will be a green or a blue, and then bacteria will kind of form like a sludge on the bottom. So it's really important to observe this process as it's happening every day to make sure that you have a clean mycelium. So that's what a healthy mycelium will look like. So then the next part um, of the process is transferring this highly nutritious grain onto a bulk substrate. So I prefer to use sawdust and um, some various supplements like wheat bran or soy, and then just uh, two liters of water will go into this five pound substrate bag. So you want the substrate to fully uh, hydrate, and in order to achieve uh, a high yielding bag, you want your water to be at the maximum capacity without pooling at the bottom of the bag. So that's about 50% to 60% uh, moisture content for this kind of sawdust. And then after that hydrates, um, you can see it's starting to go through the bag. You'll want to sterilize this bag so that there's no other fungi present. Um, that will be competing with your mycelium. So this is a pressure cooker. There's a lot of different kinds out there. This is just a basic Presto. And um, in order to sterilize this substrate, you would fill this up with water and then put it on a stove top or a heating plate. And then that will sterilize at 250 degrees and 15 PSI for about 60 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on the size of your substrate. So after it's been sterilized and cooled, um, and this would all be performed in, a, in front of a laminar flow hood, you're going to mix in your grain spot. So you can think of these as like little nutrient capsules of mycelium that are going to go into your bulk substrate, which is sawdust, um, hardwood sawdust, especially for oyster mushrooms. So you're just gonna wanna break up these clumps so that the different grains can spread evenly throughout the bag. And now you're gonna wanna seal the bag and um, this filter patch allows for air exchange so that the mycelium can breathe, but it prevents any contaminants from coming in. So we have a, a heat sealer here, which is um, another essential tool, and that creates a nice airtight seal so that there's not going to be any transfer of uh, organisms while this mycelium is growing out. So then, In order to speed up the colonization process, I'll just mix up that spawn into this bag and then incubate it for two weeks. And then two weeks later, you'll have a fully colonized bag. So this is the mycelium right here, which is the roots of the mushroom. And it's very firm and dense. And once again, you're gonna wanna pay attention so that there's no contaminants during this incubation phase. So after you have a fully colonized bag, there's a few options depending on the different species of mushroom. So one option is to side fruit your mushrooms. And all you would do at this point 
is squeeze the air out of the bag. I use um, rubber bands to keep the top sealed tightly against the mycelium. And then you just cut little slices in the bag. And you can see this is a nice lion's mane mushroom that's been fruiting for about three weeks now. And it's pretty much ready for harvest. So this is an example of side fruiting. Um, it's kind of nice because you can stack up lots of bags in your grow space and it's very efficient. But another way to fruit is to top fruit like these beautiful piapini right here. So these are black poplar mushrooms that have been pinning for about two weeks. And I really like top fruiting because it's easy to produce multiple flushes. So for example, this is already a second flush. And um, if I wanted to continue the growth on this bag, I would just um, harvest these mushrooms like this. Oh, yeah. So got a nice uh, dinner worth of piapini. And then my trick is that I'll just take these flaps and lay them back over and set it back in the grow room. And after about 10 to 12 days, it will start to pin again. And you can get about um, two or three flushes per bag this way. And that's my top fruiting technique. So that's kind of um, my process from start to finish. There's a few factors that I'll talk about later when it goes into fruiting. But for um, side fruiting, if you want to continue your flushes, all you would do is harvest the mushroom and make sure that this area where you just harvested is clean so that, um, especially with lion's mane, it's going to regenerate and you could probably get about two or three more flushes out of that same pole. And then once all my, um, the mycelium is spent, it will start to diminish the size of the fruits. Then I just compost all the substrate in the garden and it really helps with the vegetables or, you know, um, various uh, biologies in the soil. That makes sense. All right, so that's my method. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Zach and he's gonna kind of go through a completely different method of cultivation that is a little bit more basic and I guess less complicated. Yeah, that was really great. I am really fond of the method that Gary just presented using techniques in the laboratory to produce high quality mush mushrooms and mycelium. Um, but I wanna introduce a technique that is amazing in a different way because of the simplicity, because of um, how easy it is to produce at home. Um, it's just a, a, an ingenious idea. And the idea is PF Tech. So it's basically using a container like this with a substrate, which I'll mix in just a moment, as your, in, in place of auger and the grain and the bulk substrate that you just saw Gary present, all of that is contained in one container. So it's, it simplifies the process and it makes it so that um, there's less chance of contamination because we're gonna be injecting into a sealed container. And it is just very ingenious. I, I recommend this for even experienced cultivators. If you've never tried this method, I would really like you to get your mind around this one and, and follow it all the way through the process because it might encourage new ideas on how you might cultivate mushrooms yourself. It's just a very ingenious method. And if you're a brand new to um, mushroom cultivation, what Gary presented might be a little daunting. This is what you know I teach in the class, is that I teach those processes. And it can be quite overwhelming because there's a lot of steps and there's some, some practice, there's a learning curve involved. But this is very simple. And I'll show you what basically this is. Um, we're taking a half pint jar, it's wide mouth. And so the lid, there's a few ways to do the lid. I've done the lid by just putting an injection port in the top. So that allows um, you to inject with a syringe in there and it keeps it sealed. A, a really traditional way of doing this would be to poke holes with a nail, maybe three or four holes in the top and then cover it with foil so you're just injecting through the holes. So that's even easier than the injection port if you don't have that. And the inside of it, we are gonna have what is called, it's the BRF 
cake. It's the brown rice flour cake. And when it comes out, this is um, freshly made, freshly sterilized. And it's just a, a cake, a dense cake that is made with brown rice flour and vermiculite and water. It's very simple, easy, easy as baking a cake, maybe easier. So this is the substrate that the, um, the mushrooms are grown. If you're trying to grow um, wood loving species like Gary was showing, the lion's mane, the piokino, you might want to substitute or supplement with uh, some sawdust. You can, in place of vermiculite, you can use sawdust or as a supplement. It might get you a little better yield. This is not going to give you the best yield. It's, it's, a, it's a really simplified method. Okay, so how do we do it? We are going to start with two parts of vermiculite. Vermiculite is a mineral. So there's one part, two parts, two parts of this spongy uh, mineral. And then you want to do one part of water, which I'm not going to measure because I'm trying to reach field capacity. Like Gary was mentioning, you don't want water sitting in it. So I'm going to start by mixing the water in slowly. And I'll mix it, mix it, mix it until it doesn't have any dry spots. And a little bit of water might spill out. Whoops. So there's no water in the bottom of the bowl. Uh, when I squeeze it, some water will come out, but it, it's holding the water. So this is, has reached field capacity. The next thing is I put one part of brown rice flour. So you can get this at the grocery store. You can get vermiculite here at Lion's Mane, or there's, there's other areas that you can get it locally. Um, and, and I'm gonna be careful about this because I don't wanna just dump it in and then get it too dry. I'm just put a little bit at a time and I'm gonna mix it in. What the idea is that you're trying to coat all these little grains of vermiculite with brown rice flour. And it's, it's not difficult at all. Just, you don't want clumps of brown rice. So you just do it a little bit at a time until it's fully covered. And the proportions again are two parts vermiculite, one part water, and one part brown rice. But you know the, the recipe, I wouldn't necessarily follow the recipe exactly. I would I go for a texture. So I'm just kind of mixing it up. And you see it's it's loose. It's it feels kind of heavy. It feels a little bit damp, but it's not it's not clumping to my fingers. It's not making um, mushy balls, there's no water in there. So it's just making a really fluffy substrate. And th so this, again, if you wanted to grow wood loving species, you can supplement with or replace the vermiculite with sawdust and do this exact same thing. Um, although you might wanna soak the sawdust for a few hours to make sure it hydrates fully. Uh, so then at that point, we're going to fill up the jars. And so there's a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, the standard way, well, you would do it loosely. You don't want to pack it in there. You don't want this to be a really crushed, packed cake. You want it to be very loose. So the way I'm going to do it for my jars, since I have, since I have an injection port in there and I'm not, I didn't poke holes with the nail, I am going to fill it all the way to the top. And then I'll just put the, screw the lid down. And then these are going to go into the pressure cooker the same way that the technical method takes. You want to bring it up to a high temperature, maybe for 30 minutes, depending on how many jars you're doing at one time. So the standard method would be to put the substrate in really loosely and leave maybe a quarter inch gap at the top. And just kind of want to even it up without pressing it down too hard. And then you would take vermiculite and make a dry vermiculite layer on the surface. And what that does is if you have holes open to the air in there, it, it creates a filter so that the dry vermiculite is um, not conducive for mycelium to grow in the dry rock. And it, it creates an air filter so that there's a little bit of layer of protection. I don't need that with this injection port because they're sealed. Um, if I was going to have holes nailed in there, I would want to make sure to, uh, before I put the ring on, I would want to make sure that I have a foil covering to make sure that the holes 
don't let dirty air in there after they come out of the pressure cooker. So the ring will snug that down. And then a good practice would be to put a foil hat over the top so that when you take them out of the pressure cooker, the, the surface hasn't gotten dirty and you can just take this off when you're ready to inoculate. So these would go into the pressure cooker. You'll have an inch or two of water in the bottom to make sure that you don't damage your pressure cooker. So you would cook those, I would say for 30 minutes. Um, it's really important to make sure that you aren't too anxious to do this and you make sure that they cool off completely. You want them to be, if they're warm to the touch, they're still too hot to work with. So make sure that you just relax, let them cool down, maybe plan on doing your inoculation the next day, make sure they're totally cold. Then once they come out of the pressure cooker, they will look a lot like, they will look like this, basically the same as how they went in. There's kind of a gray cake and we're going to inoculate these. I would recommend using a still air box which is basically just a clear storage tub with two holes in it. It protects the working environment. You're able to sanitize it with rubbing alcohol, but I'm not gonna do that just for demonstration purposes. And what I'm gonna do here, you can do two different things. This is a liquid culture. So it has mycelium growing inside of it. It has live mycelium. The other possibility is a spore syringe. The spore syringe would have spores, which are, they're alive, but they're not active. Um, and they're, they're very different products, but you can use either one on this type of material. So I'm going to take this syringe, it's a 10 cc syringe, and I'm gonna put about one cc in each one of these. So you could do about 10 jars. Maybe if you stretch it, you could do 12, which is a full flat. And I'm going to um, sanitize my hands. And with, this is rubbing alcohol, and I'm going to sanitize the, the tops of this so that the, the injection port doesn't get contamination directly in there. And I'm going to take this syringe and just put it right in the injection hole, and I put in about one cc. You might want to start by squirting a little bit just out into the open to make sure that you're not um, squirting too much just to get a use to using the syringe. Um, but you basically just put one cc in each jar. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you here. You wanna make sure that you get the needle close to the glass. So you put it in and put it close to the glass. The reason for this is it helps you with your patients. If, if these germinate quickly, you'll start seeing them growing along the edge. If you squirt it right in the middle, it could take two weeks for it to get to the edge and you might think that you failed. So if you inject this right by the edge, you are going to get the first signs of the mycelium germinating, whether it's spores or liquid culture. So that's the first step. The next thing is just wait. You probably want to wait a week or two. It's going to be faster if you use um, if you use liquid culture. It's going to be faster because the mycelium is already growing and ready. Um, if you're using spores, it could take a week or two longer. So after this was inoculated about a week ago, you can see there's a gray spot. It's not fully colonized. So one week, this one is almost colonized, but I'm, I wouldn't start using it until next week. I'd want to give it a full week after it's fully colonized before I would start using it. Um, this one is fully colonized. So this one was uh, inoculated two weeks ago. It's fully colonized. And the next thing that you want to do is you dunk it. It's called the dunk and roll. So there's a few ways to do this. You can do it in a bowl or in a bucket. But one way that I've been doing is you just open the lid. It smells like oyster mycelium. This is oyster. And you can just carefully fill the jar with water up to the top. And what's th what this is doing is it's rehydrating that vermiculite so that the mushrooms have a water resource. You know that mushrooms tend to come up after rainstorms. It's because the hydration is needed in order to expand their cells. So that's the dunk and you can do it for 12 hours or 24 hours. So then I have some that I already did. These I dumped last night. So now we're on to the roll. 
the roll method. So we'll take this, this bowl, and all I'm gonna do is just dump these out. Just dump the water out. So at this point, this is non-sterile. We're doing fruiting. We're, we're not cultivating them really. So it's, it's a non-sterile process. It'd be better if you use clean hands, but you really don't have to. It's going into dirty vermiculite. And so this is the roll. I'm rolling it in dry vermiculite. And what this does is it creates a casing layer around the outside and it protects the mycelium from drying out. And it's, um, you don't have to do it, but it's, it's a good practice. So then this would go right in the fruiting chamber after this. So I'll do a few of these. Dumping the water out. And some people call this birthing. So it just goes right into the vermiculite. We'll do a few right here. And then I'll show you how to get it into the fruiting chamber in a second. So we're just dumping, birthing these little cakes. And then they just fall right out, covered with mycelium. You can see there's white mycelium all the way around. They're pretty dense. And then you just cover them quickly. You don't want to let them dry out. You want, they need to be wet in order to go in here. And it creates a casing layer. It covers up all the mycelium. Next, we're going to move them into the fruiting chamber. And this is pretty interesting because a lot of people tell me I would start growing mushrooms except I don't have the space. And you can do you can do mushroom cultivation in a very small area. This is actually kind of a large fruiting chamber, so you can do it in the small, smaller than this. But this is basically a, a clear storage tub that has perlite in the bottom. Different from vermiculite, it's perlite. It's a white volcanic, uh, volcanic-like pumice almost. And it's soaked with water. And it, it's reaching 80% humidity in there, which is pretty good. And the next thing that I would do is I would just take the lid, take the lid that they were growing on and put it in there and just set the cake on the lid, just like that, and then put it in the fruiting chamber. So we'll take, take another lid and just set it in the fruiting chamber. You wanna give them even space so that they, so that they have room to breathe. And that's about it. You put that on the top and you might need to mist them periodically. Um, it's gonna depend on your specific growing environment, your temperature, the airflow in your room. There's, there's several variables. This, this particular style is I have a large hole here and some holes along the side. This um, is modeled after a monotub. There, another method would be called a shotgun fruiting chamber, which would be very similar. Um, another method is that you can do it with unmodified tub, but you'll have to open it up and fan it like this because you need to get that the air exchange going. You'll have to do that manually. So an important thing, you'll want to have a spray bottle and you want to make sure that the perlite stays moist because you want to keep it in the like 70s, 80s, 90% humidity. And so at this point, it could be a week or two for the mushrooms to produce. You might be able to get multiple flushes by, by rehydrating them, by dunking them. Um, but that's basically one of the simpler methods for cultivating mushrooms. And like I said earlier, if you're an experienced mushroom cultivator, but you haven't tried this method, I really would like to get your gears working on what other possibilities there are other than just following these sterile procedures. Um, because the, the world of mycology is really under-examined. So I'd like to get your gears moving on odd techniques. And if you're just getting started, this is a great way, place to get started. And then while you're working on this, because this is going to take four to six to eight weeks, while you're working on this, you can learn the methods that Gary was teaching so that you can kind of work out the bugs and have some quick success. Cool. So that was an awesome demonstration. And I just wanted to point out that even if you're doing a five pound fruiting block, you can um, fruit that this kind of a block inside a similar chamber as that. So you don't need a high technical fruiting room and in order to get success like this. But I would like to say that one of the most important aspects 
of mushroom cultivation is going to be the sterilization. So we had mentioned that um, you can use a pressure cooker and in commercial operations, you can use a large autoclave, a retort autoclave, and that's going to prevent any contaminants from competing against your mycelium of choice. And that's very important when you're producing large quantities of mushrooms because contamination is a time cost and it's going to diminish any kind of um, yields that you're getting. So the, the most common way is just pressure and temperature sterilization. So you're gonna wanna bring your substrate up to um, 250 degrees and 15 PSI for at least 90 minutes or so, depending on um, the size of your substrate. So there's ways that you can test for sterility. Um, I like to use the little sterilization pouches with an indicator, but another super easy method, especially if you're doing like a PF tech, is to just have a blank um, sterilized substrate and leave it out at room temperature for a few days. If you completed your sterilization properly, then there should be no growth and that will be um, stable for you know a few weeks and that's a really good way to test yourself to see where any potential contaminants could be coming. And the same thing goes for auger and um, grain spawn. It's always good to just leave uh, one little vessel behind so that you can tell yourself that, all right, if there's contamination, did it come from my sterilization process or did it come from my technical process of you know, introducing contaminants with my hands or the environment or, you know, um, any kind of fomite, like if you use a dirty tool for your transfers. So these are all things that um, you have to be keeping in mind while you're, you're doing your whole process. So um, another form of um, media preparation is pasteurization. So that's different from sterilization because it's not going to eliminate all the microbes that could be competing, but it's going to diminish any, any of those from um, becoming competitors with the mycelium. So you wanna kind of explain um, the process of pasteurization versus sterilization. Yeah, so my uh, staple is to use a pressure cooker. So I really recommend using that method. Um, but there are other methods. Uh, you can use hot water pasteurization just by getting water to a boil and trying to insulate that heat as much as possible so that it, it kills as many of the competitors as it can. But it, it doesn't eliminate all of them. And sometimes you would prefer that. Uh, another method would be to use cold pasteurization. This is um, a product that, I'm, that I use. Uh, you can pick this up here at Lion's Mane. It's a pre-made, ready-to-go cold pasteurization bag. And this isn't quite as successful as using a pressure cooker or an autoclave, but it's so simple that I, I use it myself. So you basically just take the bag, open the bag, and read the directions, um, but you just put in the required amount of water. And this is totally non-sterile. I wouldn't be doing this in a laboratory, although it might be better if you have one, you might as well use a lab. But you just add the water. And the important part is to make sure that you are agitating it and make sure that the whole thing mixes very well. You want to have it thoroughly mixed. You get all the corners emptied out, mix it up really good. And this is just cold tap water. If you wanted to use um, boiled water, that would probably work as long as you make sure that it cools down. And you would let this sit for maybe 10 minutes and it'll hydrate. You might be able to watch it hydrate. Earlier I did this one and it's, it's already hydrated. You can see the difference. It's absorbed. And so it's going through a, a uh, pH change process. So it, it's killing a lot of the, the microbes just by changing the pH rapidly. And so the next process, once it's been fully hydrated, is you would just take grain spawn, which you would produce in the same method that, that Gary showed, or you can purchase these online from several companies. 
just pre-made. So you just break this up. This is a reishi Ganoderma multipillium, and just get it all loosened up. Open your bag, open the lid, and add it to the bag. So here I'm putting one quart. I'm putting one quart of grain spawn in there, which is, is kind of a lot. And so in order to compete with some of the competitors that are still alive in there, I'm just putting a lot of grain spawn in there. And then I'm going to seal this with the impulse sealer, but you could use a zip tie or you could use tape. There's, there's a few methods of, of sealing the top. Just like a cookie, a cookie bag, you can twist it up and roll it over. And at this point, I'm gonna mix it just like you would if it was a sterile bag. Turn it over a few times, make sure that those drain spawn seeds get all the way mixed through there. And uh, this method works for a lot of wood loving um, mushrooms. My favorite one to use on this is reishi. So this is a reishi that I did in April. So it's been several months and it's growing out inside the bag. And I like this method because you can trap a bunch of air in there and the reishi will start growing antlers and you don't even need a fruiting chamber. So this is all the space that you really need if you're trying to grow reishi. So another important um, part of the process is inducing fruiting. So like you said here, um, this, this block is fruiting in vitro, so it's not exposed to any of the outside air, but it does have this filter patch, which allows for air exchange. So I believe that probably one of the most important aspects of fruiting is to have the proper air exchange. So mushrooms, um, like humans, they breathe in oxygen and exhale CO2 and um, water. So in order for a mushroom to have a fully formed body, it has to have somewhere for that CO2 to go. So if you're gonna be using a fruiting chamber, like a shotgun fruiting chamber or a monotub, then the way that you um, take care of the air exchange is just by manually lifting and closing the lid. So in my operation, I use a really um, systematic setup of uh, different vents and fans, and my air is exchanged inside my fruiting chamber um, two or three times an hour, and that allows for the mushrooms to breathe properly. So the first factor in fruiting mushrooms, and probably the most important, is to have the proper air exchange. Um, so in addition to air exchange, you're gonna want the proper humidity, like he showed in the, um, in the taupe. Um, lion's mane will like humidity between 85 to 95 and even 99% humidity right when they're starting to fruit or pin um, is very critical. So another factor in fruiting is the temperature. So mushrooms prefer cold temperature because they tend to fruit right after a rain. So anywhere in you know the 60 degrees to 75 degrees is ideal, but the more control that you have over your temperature, your humidity, and your air exchange, the more likely you're gonna have consistent mushrooms. So if you have too high CO2 buildup, you'll get really laggy and stemmy oyster mushrooms, or if you're growing lion's mane, it's gonna come out um, not uniform and um, almost like corally, but it just depends on the various um, species that you're growing. And um, if you have two dry mushrooms, they're gonna abort. So that's gonna be really disappointing because you went through that whole effort to get them to pin and if they run out of um, humidity, then they'll kind of go into hibernation mode and you'll have to start over. Um, and then for temperature, um, temperature is a big factor in contaminant control. So if you have really high temperatures in your high, humid, um, high humidity environment, then it's gonna induce yeast and molds and some bacteria to start to compete against your, your fungus. So, um, I tend to keep my grow rooms on the cooler side 
it will slow the, um, the growth rate, but it will produce higher quality mushrooms. And um, I think that's just really important to have the highest standard of mushroom and, and compared to a high turnover, um, which has a high rate of contamination. So these are kind of factors um, that I keep in mind while I'm fruiting my mushrooms. And um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I'll just um, go into a little more depth on this style of fruiting chamber. Um, so it's just, uh, I think this is a 190 quart tub and it has a loose fitting lid. So yeah, you can, you can put large mushroom blocks in here. You wouldn't want to jam it really full. Maybe you do one or two in here because they're producing carbon dioxide. And this design is, is modeled after, after the mono tub. It's, it's kind of adaptive. So on this side, I'm using, uh, this is micropore tape. So it'll, it's kind of like the filter patch on the bag. It's not quite as, as good, but it, it prevents insects and dirt, and, um, but it allows air exchange. So what's happening in here is that the carbon dioxide is more dense than the rest of the air. So it falls to the bottom and it can come out these holes. So the carbon dioxide is exiting. And then fresh air can come in this hole. So the way that you want to modulate this is um, a, a lot of kits that you'll find online will, have, will come with heat, heating and lights and all, all kinds of stuff. You want to monitor or modulate the environment here by your ambient room. So if your room is too hot, you want to air condition your room. If it's too cold, you want to heat the room. You're not wanting to directly heat this box. And if you're getting a lot of condensation, lots of drips, like rain coming down from the sides, you want to raise the temperature of the room a little bit. You want to have a little bit of condensation, but you don't want lots of water condensing on your mushrooms. So modulate the temperature of the room. And mushrooms do need light. They don't need really strong light, but they, they want to grow toward the light and they produce um, secondary metabolites, just like we produce vitamin D when we're outside in the sun. Mushrooms have a similar response to the sun, but they can grow, they can live without light. But you wanna have light in your room. This wouldn't go like in a dark closet. It wouldn't work very well. Uh, you'd want to have this in, a, in an area that gets indirect light, but bright enough that it's able to respond to the light. Um, you also want to be concerned about the airflow. If you're getting lots of condensation in here, you might want to turn on a fan and get some air circulation. If it's drying up too quickly, maybe you want to move it to an area that has less air movement. Um, also, you want to monitor, well, I'll show you this again. This is the perlite. Let's see if I can get a little bit. This is the perlite and you want to keep it damp. This, this has a high surface area, and so a lot of evaporation is happening, and that's what's filling this tub with humidity. So if this dries out, then your tub's gonna dry out. Now this I just use to monitor it periodically. If you leave this in here, it's going to error out, so it has to be kept in kind of a dry environment, and you can put it in here for a few minutes to test your humidity. Um, this just came from the grocery store. So that's, a basic rundown of this, and you can you can supplement, but you don't want to be spraying a ton. If you can modulate it just by having your your airflow and your temperature and your um, perlite hydrated properly, you wouldn't be using this bottle very much, except for to maybe wet down a couple of dry spots. So you want to rely on getting the tub dialed in. Um, if you're really struggling, maybe change the size of your holes or the placement of your holes. So I know that was kind of a lot to take in, but I hope that all of that kind of made sense. And I think that um, now we're gonna open it up to some questions. Yeah, if you have any questions about the processes that we demonstrated or any questions about your specific environment, um, we will try to monitor the, the questions and see if we can give you some good response. Yeah, so you got some questions already. Um, Great. Thank you very much, guys. That was really awesome. Um, Thanks. We've also put in, um, for those of you who are in the audience, we've put links to 
mushroom cult and fresh from the farm fungi in the chat window so you can check out their websites uh yeah. we got some questions um for the absolute beginner what are some of the advantages and joys of mushroom cultivation so can you reflect on your beginnings yeah so i think as far as advantage of growing your own mushrooms i think one of the primary ones is that you're going to get them fresh you're going to get them as fresh as possible you're able to pick them and immediately consume them and there's not a lot of metabolism going on between when you pick them and when you you produce them also um, i do a little bit of foraging but you can't get oysters all year long there there are certain seasons that they'll be coming out and you know if you don't get rain you're not going to get your oysters but you're able to cultivate them at home on your own schedule i think that's a, a huge benefit yeah for me i really enjoy the aspect of you know starting off with something super small and watching it develop like i'm just a green thumb at heart so i feel like you know my passions kind of collided with mycology because of my laboratory background but one of my favorite things about cultivated mushrooms is that there's no bugs like it's kind of like i've eaten plenty of mushrooms with bugs in it but there's nothing that beats like a fresh, you know, bug-free lion's mane. And that's, you know, what I can bring to the mushroom community. It's really high quality mushrooms at a consistent rate. And on top of that, um, mushroom growing in general is a very like efficient process and it produces, you know, very minimal waste. So besides yeah, from the plastic bags, which, you know, I would, love to get away from them but they're so easy and convenient and necessary and there's um some bags that we use that are produced by Myers mushroom they're uh, biodegradable bags so it's you know i don't really know how long it takes for these to break down but other than that it's completely compostable and um, very efficient i use locally sourced ingredients so it's coming from some woodworkers in denver and um, I feel like it would end up in the, in the, um, the garbage essentially if I didn't cultivate mushrooms on it. And in addition to producing high quality food, I can then compost that, that hardwood sawdust in my garden and produce a really luscious, um, soil utilizing mushrooms. So, um, those are some of you know, the things that I enjoy about growing your own mushrooms and just really understanding the whole life cycle about fungi is interesting. And, you know, I'm constantly thinking of ways to improve it. And it's just a, a never ending rabbit hole of knowledge. So, you know, it's once you get started and catch the itch, it's really hard to stop researching and learning more and more. And, you know, I've, done PF Tech before and I really like it for breeding new strains and then testing it out in, in you know a commercial setting and there's you know so many opportunities for improvement so that's kind of you know one of the reasons why I enjoy it. Yeah so on the question of like how I got started um, the thing that piqued my interest so when I was in high school I was collecting orchids and I had a large collection of orchids. I went to CSU because of my love for horticulture. And, um, you know, in my collecting orchids, I realized that, you know, there's about 30, maybe 40 species of orchids that live in the Colorado mountains. And most of them, well, all orchids, the seeds need to be infected by a fungi in order for them to um, germinate. They germinate and they parasitize the fungi. So that's what kind of got my gears turning on, on that kingdom of, of um, organisms. Um, I've, I've never used fungi in order to cultivate orchids, but that's kind of what introduced me and, and spurred my curiosity. And then when I went to CSU, I was introduced to the lab procedures and started my journey on learning how to cultivate. And it's just really interesting to grow them yourself because um, when you go out to forage, you find them in an instant of time. But when you grow them yourself, you get to see the whole story of their life cycle. You get to see the whole growth of the mushroom and it's, it's really fascinating to see and witness how they respond to the environment. 
Yeah, great. Um, some other questions that we have from Facebook. Luke asked, um, during which steps of, during which of all of these many steps do you need to really be concerned about sterilization? Or are there steps where sterilization is less of a concern? Okay, so basically, um, the, fir the first steps are the most important to be sterile. And as you go down, if you can keep the sterility, you're better off. But as it starts going down the chain, it's a little less important, especially when it gets to fruiting. When you're actually cutting the bag open, the sterility, you're really not concerned about that very much. Um, you don't want to be spreading contamination, obviously. So cleanliness is better, but you don't have to be clean at all once you get to the mushroom production, depending on your, what your goals are. If it's your livelihood, you probably want to keep it clean. Like he keeps his, his grow rooms very clean. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the most important part is auger. Um, you always want to have a clean start. So um, your auger transfers, you know, your liquid culture um, production, all of the lab work has to be sterile because then you're going to end up just multiplying something that you don't want like a yeast or a mold so i think the lab procedures are most important and then like you said as you move into grain spawn and um like sawdust and even pasteurization it just becomes less and less important but in order to keep um contaminants out of your process it's really important to keep your grow room clean um you know i use hydrogen peroxide and it's very good at mitigating spore load. And you know, there's ways to test that as well, which I'm planning on producing some videos in the future on environmental te tests and um, even like some safety tests. I've done a couple talks on mycotoxins and um, just, I feel like sterility throughout the whole process is important, but once you cut that slice, you know, the mushrooms are open to the world. So they have a really strong immunity as well. And, you know, there's some mushrooms that produce exudates that mitigate bacteria. And that's another part of the process that we can research more is how can you utilize some of those um, enzymes or exudates and possibly keep contaminant down without doing, you know, really large sterilization runs. and um, there's a lot of opportunity out there for that. I guess if your question is specifically about PF Tech, you need absolutely no sterility when you're making these jars. You can do it with dirty hands in a dirty kitchen. But once it goes in the pressure cooker, as it comes out of the pressure cooker, you want to keep this clean. You don't want to open the jar. You want to make sure that your syringe tip stays clean and that your port stays clean during that injection. And if you, in between, sneeze on the needle or touch it to something else, you need to heat sterilize the needle before moving on. So there's um, some very simple steps with PF Tech for keeping it clean. Um, but once this is fully colonized, you really don't need to worry about it. Um, another question, just a question of my own. Uh, do you guys ever use like small amounts of maybe antibiotic in your agar plates in order to avoid bacterial contaminants? You might have mentioned this. Yeah, so um, I have a personal vendetta against antibiotics. I think that, you know, especially um, in a large scale production that it could lead to creating resistant bacteria in the environment just by throwing out that auger. And um, that's just my personal take on it. I know that a lot of people do use antibiotic um, often, but there's other techniques like water auger, um, which Zach has introduced me to recently. And I made a video about water auger, which it's a nutrient deprived media so that the mushroom can flourish, but other bacteria or fungi are inhibited because there's no other um, substances. So the, the mycelium will actually outcompete things just because it's so resilient to small amounts of nutrients, which is a good you know, alternative to antibiotics, but antibiotics are produced by fungi in the first place. It's a very touchy subject, but I just steer, you know, caution against it because of um, the downstream effects that it could have. What do you think? Yeah, so I have not used antibiotics 
but I am, I'm very curious because I do a lot of cultivating from the wild. I, I like harvesting a mushroom, bringing it home and cloning it. And sometimes it is impossible to clone because it's just so full of bacteria, yeast, and all, all this stuff going on. I recently had a failed experiment with slime molds, and I just, I wish I had some antibiotic plates that I could use to help me in those extreme circumstances. But most of the time, even when cloning from the wild, if you get a, a decently um, healthy mushroom, your technique is way more important than, than your tools. Cool. I would agree with that. Cool, we got a couple more uh, questions here that we will field. Um, one is by Alan, he's actually got, a, I think, a multi-pronged question. What brand of humidifier um, do you prefer to humidify your tents? And he said he purchased a four by eight by six and a half tent. Couldn't remember which humidifier you mentioned in your class. And does Lion's Mane sell the large sealer? I don't know if you got all of that. All right, so humidity, um, the brand, the big brands out there, like I use an ultrasonic mister, um, and then I'm not sure exactly what brand it is, but if you just look on Amazon, there's a few different variations, and I prefer the ones with lots of the ultrasonic heads, um, just because it produces that really, you know, dense fog. But one of the downsides is if one of those discs um, gets dirty or you know degrades over time, you have to purchase the whole entire head again, which those are those can get pretty costly. But they make smaller ones. If you have you know a four by six tent, I would recommend getting a four-headed um, ultrasonic mister, and that produces a really nice fog. Um, but I started you know with just a four four by four tent and a little like five gallon um, humidifier from Target and that worked fine. It got pretty annoying like filling it up with water every day, but um, you can make, you know, a lot of things work. It just depends on your creativity. What do you think? Yeah, so the, the tent that I have is a four by four by maybe it's eight tent. It might be the same one that is being asked about. And I just use a, a VIX um, humidifier. They're about this big around. And, and the reason is because the, the opening, you can pull the little spout off and you can fit a pipe just from Home Depot. You can grab, what is it? Like maybe a two inch pipe and it fits pretty tightly. All you have to do is seal it with um, electrical tape. Um, the downside of that is that it's only about a gallon. And so that can be, maybe you need to change it every day or, or more often. And so I have to adapt it so it'll hold five gallons and it'll run for, a week and maybe when it's colder it'll run for two weeks yep. and then as Ooh. far as um the supplies i'm not sure if they have any of these on hand but you can always email them or come stop on down like the um matt and tatiana are super knowledgeable and they can point you in the, the right direction as far as humidifiers or heat sealers and um, i believe they have sterilizers here and all this cool lab equipment um, my favorite thing is this media extraction device. Uh, it helps me produce a lot of liquid cultures really fast and, you know, it's super nifty and Matt hand makes all these himself, which is really cool. Um, but yeah. All right. Sounds, sounds really good. There's one last question regarding um, growing uh, fungi on grains. What if a person is intolerant to grains? I think that's going to be an issue for growing mycelium on grains. Yeah, so any, if it's a gluten intolerance, there's several grains that you can use that aren't, that are gluten free. Rice is a really common one. It's a little tricky, but you can dial in your, your method and use rice. So that's a gluten free uh, grain. But if you're absolutely grain intolerant, then Gary has a method that yeah, so I use um, sawdust spawn, um, especially in shiitake. I had a, uh, one of our customers who, she was very sensitive. She was gluten-free um, and I believe a celiac patient or something, something along those lines. So I, you know, grew um, some shiitake only on sawdust and, you know, she loved it, but there could be a, ch a chance of some carryover. I just... I'm not too familiar with um, the chemistry behind that, but there are 
alternatives like corn. You can use um, corn cobs. Um, you can also use, you know, various like uh, quinoa or, uh -huh. yep, that's pretty, that's a, I believe a gluten-free grain. So there's alternatives to um, oats and rye berries. It's just super accessible. And in my experience, it just produces the, the best yields. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, Tatiana put up um, uh, the Lions main website earlier in the chat. I am just going to post again uh, the links to your guys' websites as well as uh, lionsmaindenver.com. And thank you very much. That was a very enlightening and inter entertaining uh, presentation. You guys put it off, pulled it off seamlessly. Got yourselves right. on the back. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you so much for giving us, you know, the platform and the opportunity to share our knowledge. And um, we're looking forward to the day that we can all meet in person. But, you know, this is very, um, it, was, it was a very uh, enjoyable thing to be participating. And, um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all the work. And, you know, you guys are wonderful. Yeah. No problem. We'll see you guys uh, hopefully in the near future. Bye-bye. Much love.